Some call it the forgotten revolution of the Arab Spring. Five years ago this week, thousands of protesters gathered at the Pearl Roundabout in the Bahraini capital of Manama, demanding reforms, demanding democracy. The Bahraini royal family accused Iran of being behind the protests and with the help of troops from Saudi Arabia, used what Human Rights Watch called lethal force to stay in power. Today, the Bahraini government claims all is well in that tiny Gulf Island kingdom. But is that really the case? I'm joined in the arena to debate this by Bahraini activist Mariam al Khawaja, exiled co-director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights, who's been sentenced in absentia by the Bahraini authorities, and whose father, also a human rights activist, is serving a life sentence in prison. And from Manama by Dr. Mansur al Arayad, chairman of the Gulf Council for Foreign Relations and a former member of Bahrain's Shura Council. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Uh, Mariam al Khawaja, five years on, is it fair to say that the Bahraini revolt the Bahraini protests, call it what you want, against the ruling Khalifa royal family were a failure. Unlike Egypt, unlike Tunisia, you didn't topple the regime, which is pretty secure today and still has all of its global Western allies on, on board. I would definitely not call it a failed uprising. I mean, when we're looking at a situation where people are demanding social and political change, it's not something that happens in five years. It's something that takes a long time. Um, and I think that the situation currently is unsustainable and will bring about change. Now, it's either going to happen through a very violent situation where it's going to get very bloody because the, the government just refuses to change uh, its position on reforms and actually giving people what they want, or it's going to happen through international pressure and the government being forced into doing the right thing. Either way, change is going to come. We still have protests almost on a daily basis in Bahrain. The main thing that's changed is that the crackdown went from being a knee-jerk reaction during which uh, it was very chaotic, the crackdown was all over the place, into a situation now where the crackdown is very much institutionalized. Judi the judiciary today is the main tool that is being used to silence dissent in the country. Okay. And, and you mentioned the judiciary. How have you personally and your family been affected uh, by what's happened in Bahrain since 2011? Well, my father, my brothers-in-law were arrested, severely tortured, physically, psychologically, and sexually. Um, and then my father was sentenced to life in prison. My uncle was sentenced to five years in prison. My brothers-in-law, who are not active on any level, were arrested just for being married to my sisters, were also uh, tortured and then released after time in prison. Um, and currently, my sister is facing three years and one month imprisonment for, on one of the charges, is ripping a picture of the king. And of course, our family is just one example of hundreds okay. of families who are facing these things. Uh, Dr. al Arayad, you've said in the past that what's happened in Bahrain isn't a revolution. Uh, why isn't it a revolution and what would you call it? Mariam refers to daily protests still going on there. Let's just step back a bit and look at the big picture. Human rights actually started as a foreign policy in the 70s by Przezinski and the Carter administration as being part of the human rights foreign policy and was the soul of the of, of foreign policy of the United States. Later on, in terms of Reagan, it became with democratization. After that, with the Clintons, it came with, the, uh, with aid. And after that, with uh, Bush, it came with, with the uh, fight on terrorism. Then when we came to the Arab Spring in 2010, 2011, human rights was directly connected and was part of revolutions in Arab Spring countries to topple regimes by force. This is exactly uh, an important period in the evolution of Bahrain. Later on, what has happened? Bahrain opposition saw the opportunity to mobilize a revolution in Bahrain based on the spill-off of the Arab Spring, which in its context had human rights part and parcel of changing regimes by force. He's saying that you were trying to topple a monarchy by force under, in using human rights as an excuse. Do you want to respond to that? Yes, definitely. I mean, I don't think that human rights is an excuse. Human rights is essential to any situation in any country at any given time. Bahrain has one of, if we're going to talk about history, Bahrain has one of the oldest civil rights movements in the region that started in the 1920s. We have witnessed uprisings almost every 10 years since the 1920s in Bahrain. The last one was in the 1990s. Human rights is not an excuse to topple governments. Human rights are essential 
fundamental to any country if, if citizens want to live with dignity and with freedom and with the very basic rights that are mentioned in the Universal Declaration of Human but Rights. But just to be clear for our viewers, are you calling for a toppling of the monarchy or is it something else that you want? What is your end game of the opposition? If we're opposition? talking about the situation in Bahrain right now, you have an opposition and Wafaq which are calling for a constitutional monarchy. So that means not the toppling of the monarchy. If you're talking about the people on the streets who started demanding the stepping down of the ruling family, then yes, they are demanding the stepping down of the ruling family. After people were killed on the streets for demanding basic things like a constitutional change and um, representation in government. For us as civil society and human rights defenders, what we focus on is accountability. And when I talk about accountability, I mean accountability for the king of Bahrain, for the crown prince, for the prime minister. And if that okay. means a change in government, then so be it. Dr. al -Arad, what's wrong with greater accountability in a constitutional monarchy from your perspective? No, no, L let, me just, uh, let me just continue my, my argument here. Now, in Bahrain, when you had a failed coup d'etat, for example, in the Ministry of Health, that was an attempt to topple the monarchy by force, by where doctors. human rights was part of that process. The next step, the next step, what has happened, Wait, and that so is I just crucial in trying there was to an understand to what is happening by on the doctors? ground. We're not trying to, the, this, this debate is not trying to point scores at anybody. I'm trying to explain what has happened and how can we go forward from a policy perspective. Yeah, but I'm asking, you now, made a point about the, the doctors. Next point, was what it, has are happened? you saying that the doctors were attempting no, a coup d'etat? From the hospital? I'm not talking about the doctors as people. I'm talking there was a situation of a failed coup d'etat in the Ministry of Health. And therefore, it was interpreted in terms of the uh, laws in Bahrain as a security concern rather than a human rights concern. This is where we are today. Wouldn't you say that people uh, who uh, advocate a republic in Bahrain, like Ibrahim Sharif, who was arrested, uh, people who tweet critical things about the government, like Nabil no, no, Rajab, no, no. shouldn't they be released? The European Parliament says that they should be released, the restrictions should no, be no, lowered this on is, speech you're, you're Again, you're again, no, no, you're again going into individual cases. I'm giving you from a policy perspective. The same thing has happened from the spill-off in Bahrain, the same thing has happened from the Arab Spring spill-off into France. The same spill-off has happened, for example, in Germany, where the interpretation, for example, of migrants has taken a, a context of a security rather than a context of a human rights, and therefore there was a proposal uh, in France recently to uh, amend the Constitution. The same thing is happening in Germany. So this is not unique for Bahrain. The next step comes, for example, Bahrain, same as the GCC. They are facing uh, the external challenges, which is basically uh, ISIS and Iran. And we're talking internally. We have the challenge, of course, of governance. Now, this governance is not also unique for Bahrain. It's basically for the whole Middle East. OK, it's not unique for Bahrain, Mariam, he says. I mean, going to everything that's been said, I don't even know where to start. I mean, to begin with, claiming that there was a coup d'etat within the Ministry of Health is something that goes against the government's own report, the Bahrain Commission of Inquiry, which actually said that doctors were arrested and tortured for treating protesters. So I'm not sure what Dr. Al-Arayad is actually talking about when the government's own report refutes the claims that he is making. The protest movement in Bahrain has been recognized by both international uh, human rights organizations, but also by diplomatic circles, whether it's the US government or the UK government or otherwise, as having been a peaceful movement. Now, of course, what happens that is that when people take to the streets to demand change and the government's reaction is to start killing people on the streets and to arrest them and systematically torture them physically, psychologically and sexually, it only makes sense that people start demanding that the government steps down. Let me put that to Dr. al -Arai. Dr. al -Arai, the Bahraini government's own commission of inquiry uh, acknowledged that there had been torture and called for appropriate prosecutions. That hasn't happened. Five years later, there hasn't been an improvement in the torture situation or human rights situation, according to Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the UN Human Rights Council and others. That's a fact, isn't it? Listen, human rights currently in Bahrain and also in many countries, as I gave you two other countries, I gave you France and Germany, is taking the context of security, 
And therefore, its interpretation within the law has taken that trajectory. The question is, how do you shift that? How do you shift that to allow, to allow and work with human rights organization to shift this interpretation that activity moves from a security perspective to a human rights perspective? This is not a challenge only for Bahrain. It's a challenge for many countries. Mariam Khawaja, it's a challenge for many countries. Well, I think that, I mean, to begin with, when we're talking about security versus human rights, you cannot compare Bahrain to France and Germany. You're talking about a country where there's no basic freedoms, whether it's freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of, so of association. You're looking at a country where torture is still systematic and rampant. You're looking at a country where the population of citizens is between 600 and 700,000 people, and at any given time, you have between 3,000 to 4,000 people in prison because of political issues. And so it's one of the highest per capita in the region, if not the highest. Definitely you can't compare Bahrain to Germany and France, where are countries where people actually have mechanisms, legal mechanisms, to protect themselves, where, the, where basic fundamental human rights are actually respected. And so this idea that it's human rights versus security in comparison to Europe, it's, it's a flawed argument to begin with. Dr. al it's a flawed argument to compare the two. It's not, because when we're talking, we're talking about GCC values and how to evolve these values. GCCs are monarchs, and we're trying Absolute to improve monarchs, yes. the current governance elements within the GCC. The question is, you cannot look at the GCC with the tools that Maryam al-Khawaja is trying to do. You need to see it within the GCC context. The reason being, because it makes more sense to evolve it. The objective is how to evolve policy. The objective is not a debate, a court's debate. What would you say to people who say, look, you make these criticisms, you say you want a constitutional monarchy, why then does the opposition in Bahrain boycott elections when they get the chance to take part in elections? That's first, been a criticism. First of all, of course, we need to separate. I am not part of the opposition, and I'm not calling for a constitutional monarchy. As a human rights defender, I'm calling for human rights, basic human rights, and I'm calling for accountability. We'll have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you for joining me in the arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.